So I want to preach it, and I want to preach on this subject, how to turn your crisis into a celebration. How to turn your crisis into a celebration. Let's begin reading in John chapter 2. Uh, begin reading in verse number 1. We'll read through verse 11. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And let me just back up and just say this. Anytime you get married, it would, it would behoove you to make sure Jesus is invited into that marriage. All right. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, Jesus, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servant, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I heard a preacher that had preached on this years ago, and his thought was, and I may use it one day, you better mind your mama. Whatsoever she saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins of peace. Jesus saith unto them, this is the servants in verse number 5, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and you not whence it was, but the servants which drew water knew. So the only one who knew what was going on here was the servants. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. You may be seated. Let me encourage our people. You're welcome to come back into the services. We know some that are over 65 are staying in their cars. Some of them are still staying at home. But uh, we encourage you to come back in. Uh, you say, well, I, I want to wait till everything gets normal. I don't know if that will ever happen anytime soon. Normal we, may, normal we may never see again in our country because of all the things that have happened. And, uh, but uh, we're just going to have to live with what's here and, and do the best that God's given us. And in John chapter 2, let me ask you this. Now, you think about this passage. I want to speak on that phrase found in verse number 5. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I, I really want to break it down under three headings today. But let me ask you the question as we get right into this passage. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Father, we thank you again tonight for another time to be in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for helping me uh, today and the many things that had to be done. Thank you, Lord, that you helped my wife as uh, she was outside painting on the back of the church. And, and the ladder, she was not on the ladder, Father, but you protected her. The ladder blew over and hit her in the head. I thank you, Lord, that she wasn't knocked out. She might have felt like it, but I thank you, Lord, that uh, she could have been hurt, but, Lord, she wasn't. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for safety. Thank you, Lord, as far as we know, none of our people have had the coronavirus. And that's a blessing. And we pray for some we've not seen and some of our people have not seen. We do pray for Mr. and Ms. B, who are just hunkered down there in Thompson. I pray, Lord, that you help them and guide and direct in their lives and meet every need they have. We pray for uh, Lehman Stewart, who's in the hospital. Thank you that he's better. But one of the tragic things is a lot of his family cannot visit him right now. I pray for Patty that you'll help her. She's uh, been so faithful to take care of her dad, but now she's not able to visit him in the hospital. Thank you that he's better, though. Thank you that Wyman, I mean, uh, Thomas Wyman is home tonight and, and uh, doing much better. We pray also for Brother Art Adams as Miss Helen takes him back to the doctor this week. I pray for him. I pray also, uh, uh, Lord, for others, for children. Uh, during this time, I pray for my mom and dad that you'll help both of them and my sister as she waits on them. And Lord, we do long for the day that we can all feel safe gathering together again in the house of God. Help us not to use the virus as an excuse for us not to attend church. 
Lord, help us not to be hypocritical, going every place hither and thither, but then not able to come to the house of God. Lord, I believe sometimes that uh, uh, people are so prone to use an excuse, an excuse is nothing but the skin of reason stuffed with a lie. Lord, if we can go here and there and uh, feel free to do that, we ought to feel free to come to the house of God, wear a mask, sit in the services, and listen to the word of God preached. But Lord, you know the hearts of people. We pray for our missionaries during this time that you'll help them. I pray that you'll encourage them and, and uh, strengthen them and help the money to come in. As one missionary said, they're missing about $700 a month because people are not able to support them right now. I pray for them. I pray for our president. Lord, I pray for our vice president. I pray for our governor. I pray for the elected officials. I pray for the doctors in this town. We pray for the nurses. We pray for Katie Stevens. We pray for... Uh, uh, Tanner Gillen, Lord, pray to help her. Pray for Robbie tonight, uh, Lord, who's not been doing well. I pray, Lord, you touch her body, but be thy will and heal it. I thank you, Lord, that she assured me the other day that she knew Christ as her personal Savior. And, and Lord, that's the main thing, is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And so, Lord, I pray tonight as our people, whether they're listening by Facebook, whether they're in the service, uh, whether they'll look later by YouTube, We'll take the Word of God and open it up and listen carefully to what's here. I thank you for blessing my heart and challenging my heart as I begin to study this passage. Thankful for the suggestion one man had, mentioned something, got me thinking about this passage, and oh, how, Lord, you've blessed me as I've studied it uh, for the last couple of days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, as we look at John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, I want to ask the question, have you ever hosted an important event like a reception or a dinner? I can remember when Ruth got married and when Jonathan got married and it wasn't so much when Mark got married because uh, the reception was up on up towards Atlanta, but for Jonathan, he had it here and Ruth had it here. If so, and you've ever had to host a reception or a dinner, what was your greatest fear? I'll tell you what it was to me. That people would show up who wouldn't have enough to eat. Or people would show up and wouldn't have enough to drink. Anytime we have a social at church, I, I wonder, I hope, I pray, Lord, help us to have enough. Homecoming, I trust we have enough, and God's always done it. But marriage practices among the Jews in Christ's day were quite elaborate. A big part of the marriage practice was a marriage feast or celebration. It's been known that those marriage feasts and celebrations could last several hours. Sometimes they say even days that they would eat and they would enjoy this celebration. Therefore, as we find in our passage, to run out of wine at a marriage feast was no small matter. I mean, they were in a crisis. Here they are completely out of wine, and as one commentary said, the lack of wine was a very serious problem. And I quote, this is what he said, more than a social embarrassment was involved. The bridegroom and his family may well have become involved in a heavy financial liability if they ran out of food or the wine. As a result, here of running out of wine, there could have been more than an embarrassment, it could have been a financial liability. You see, social traditions in those days obligated the marriage couple to provide adequately for the feast or to risk legal action by any of the guests. So this lack of wine was no small problem for this newly married couple. What was a celebration to start with that a marriage now has turned into a, a crisis? And there was panic at the party. We have no wine. What are we going to do? I can imagine, and Miss Mary, as I know you've done a lot of taking care of socials and stuff like this, but I can imagine people scrambling around trying to figure out what are we going to do? We don't have any wine. We ran out. But did you notice what Mary did? She took her problem to Jesus. She didn't take it to somebody else. She didn't call Walmart, call Sam's, call a caterer. She took her problem to Jesus. And I thought, how we need to learn from her example. Oftentimes, the last place we take our problem to is the Lord when he should be the first person that we take our problem problem to. May I ask you, who do you take your problems to at the beginning? I think all of us would say, first of all, we may take our problem to our wife uh, this afternoon. 
And lo and behold, I, I got ready to leave and I could not find my wallet. And I thought, where is it at? I know I had it in my office the, the, today. Uh, and I laid it there and I always do when I, when I come to the church to study and I couldn't find it. So I looked here and there and, and uh, I, I called my wife. I said, I, I said you, you haven't seen my wallet. She said, no, you had it this morning. You should have it now. I said, pray that I find it. And I, I went back to the back and Miss Meredith was cleaning the restrooms and sanitizing those. And I said, I did go to the bathroom back here today. I said, you didn't happen to find a wallet back here. And she said, no, I hadn't found it. So now I've looked, I've called my wife, I've asked Miss Mary, and at last resort, I said, Lord, you know where my wallet's at. Now I have no idea where it's at. I've looked hither and thither, I cannot find it. And about that time, church, you'll be amazed. I had a, my wife had brought me a diet coat from Chick-fil-A. And uh, when, I, when, I threw the, I, I, when I got ready to leave and I wanted to find my wallet, I put the wallet in my hand with the cup and I reached over and I dropped the cup and the wallet in the trash can. And there it was. Now, how often do we come to God at last chance? Mary went to him first. Mary took her problem to the Lord. Now, I also got to thinking about this passage and, and Brother Ken, uh, you might can help me too. I'm unsure of Mary's responsibility at this wedding. But it appears to me that she was had more than just a casual interest in this thing. She was alarmed at the policy, a possibility of embarrassment. And so she turns to Jesus for help. Now, if I had just been a guest, I probably wouldn't have turned to the Lord. I'd said, well, that's on somebody else. But, but she, is, she is taken back by the fact they have no wine because they come to him and they said, when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said, they have no wine, and she took her problem to the Lord. Now, I wonder, have you ever been in a similar situation? Have you ever depleted your resources, and you say, I have no more resources? Is your shameful situation about to be exposed that you don't have sufficient to meet the need? What should you do? Bring it to Jesus. She went and told him. Do you know, I'd rather think, and I, I got to think it as I studied this passage, I believe, Brother Ken, she's in the habit of doing that for several years because I believe that's the first thing she did. You see, a ha what you do at the first time a lot of times reveals what's become a habit in your life. She went straight to the Lord. I'd love to imagine that whenever there was any trouble in the home when Jesus was there, or whenever she heard that one of her neighbors had a difficulty, she'd always go and tell Jesus. What a sensible thing to do. What a difference it makes in people's lives if we follow the same rule. But Mary did something more than just tell him. She trusted him. All through those difficult years in the home, he'd always been sympathetic and kind and helpful, and, and she'd never known him to refuse her aid. True, he had never done a miracle because the Bible says this is the first miracle that Jesus had done. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. But Jesus had always been able to do something helpful and to ease her burdens. And so when all this trouble arises at this marriage of Canaan, a, a celebration, she does the natural thing for her, and that was go to Jesus. Because she realized, not only am I going to tell him, I'm going to trust him to do something. And then I like what happens. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, now she said unto the servants, after she told him, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. In those words, I find keys that were used to solve her problem, and our problem as well. When we have circle, when our, our, our crisis, when it, what was supposed to be a celebration, has turned into a crisis. When what was supposed to be a party now has turned into a panic, what do we do? I want you to see three things. First of all, the solution involves a spoken word. She says whatsoever he says. While you may not want to believe it, God always has something to say about your need. 
Speaking to the Jews, Jesus said, search the scriptures. He turned them to the word of God. Don't seek the counsel of the world. Turn to the word of God. How much better, church, and would we be if we'd search the scriptures for a word from God when our problem comes? Instead of going to a psychologist or going to a preacher or going to a deacon, if we would just say, what does God have to say about this problem? You see, she said, whatsoever he said. She speaks, he speaks to us authoritatively. He should have the final matter on any given subject, Jesus Christ. But oftentimes when we've got a problem, we go to seek what somebody else said. Let me see what this preacher says. Let me see what this deacon says. Let me see what this person says. When we ought to search the scriptures to see, what does God say? You see, the word of God is his authoritative voice speaking to us. And she tells them, whatsoever he said. Not only does he speak to us authoritatively, he speaks to us personally. I like this. Whatsoever he said unto you. Look at it. Get a hold of it. Whatsoever he said unto you. Notice the he and you. Here's a personal communication. Church, can I tell you, those that are listening by Facebook, this book is a personal book. It is a message from God to you. Every day I meet God in the pages of this book. God speaks to me personally through this book. I can remember this morning as I was reading in my devotions and God met me on the pages as I was going through the book of Job and God stopped me right in a verse and God spoke to my heart about that verse. He, God speaks the same way today as he did then. It's not they, whatsoever he saith unto they, whatsoever he saith unto them, whatsoever he saith unto these, whatsoever he saith unto those, whatsoever he saith unto you. He spoke personally to the servants. And the amazing thing is, the guests didn't know what he said. The man who's in charge, the ruler of the feast, didn't know what was going on. The Lord spoke personally to them. And anything you and I feel to be the voice of God and it runs contrary to his word, can I tell you, it's not the voice of God. When God speaks, he will not speak contrary to this book. This is his infallible, inerrant, authoritative word and God speaks to us Personally, And so the first thing uh, that turned this crisis, uh, th this celebration into a crisis, and now it's going to be turned back into a celebration again. The solution involves a spoken word, he said. But then notice the solution involves a strange work whatsoever. In most cases, God's manner of doing things are strange. Give to get. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. You give to get. He says in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, feed your enemy. He tells us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, lose your lives and you will find it. It seemed kind of strange with, with five loaves and two fishes to, to uh, tell the multitude to sit down. God works in strange ways. And so oftentimes the solution that will turn our crisis into a celebration involves a strange work. Now notice what it was. God says you feel those water pots. And then verse number 6, there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins of peat. Jesus and them fill the water pots with water. Most Baptists that I know of would have said, what does filling water pots with water have to do with supplying the wine that they need to drink? We ain't never done it this way, Lord. We go down to the, down to the vineyard to get the wine. We don't fill water pots with water. 
But can I tell you, God specializes in doing things his way, not our way. And then I got to thinking, what a word, whatsoever. Whatsoever means anything at all, no matter what. Can, uh, uh, would you just allow me as I've studied this thing, can you just uh, imagine, Brother Ken, Mary coming to those servants and preparing them for the possibility that God's going to ask you to do something different. She's preparing them for the possibility that he may ask you to do something that's unconventional. Mary conveyed to the servants that it's going to be a mistake to try to logically reason out the command that Jesus may give you. Well, let me tell you, she'd already experienced some unconventional methods in her life because she gave birth to the Son, gave birth to the Son of God without the aid of a man. Right. And she knew that her God was a whatsoever God, and he can do whatsoever he wanted to, but he'll never violate his scriptures. Now, I want you to think about that, that strange word, whatsoever. And I want you to be perfectly sure of this. Jesus will never ask you to do something that you can't do. Although sometimes you may think you can't do it. There are times when he asks us to do some very strange and hard things. But God has a wonderful way of helping us to do what he tells us to do. Because back of every one of the commands of God is his enablement to do it. I could give you dozens of illustrations from the Bible itself, but can I share just one with you? Do you remember that man who was in the synagogue on the day when Jesus was present who had a withered and drew up hand? Do you remember what Jesus told him to do? It's already dried up. It's already withered. Jesus told him to what? Stretch forth thy hand. That would seem impossible to do. Yet the man did it. You say, how? Because back behind the commands of God is in the name. That man found that as he trusted Jesus and started out to obey him, he was given the power to do what Jesus told him. You can do everything that Jesus told you to do in his word. And I'd say, whatsoever God tells you to do in his word, you can do it. May I suggest to you, anything that God tells you to do, you can do. God will never ask you to do anything you can't do. Number two, Jesus will never ask you to do anything you shouldn't do. Satan often and often tells uh, you to do things that are wrong and harmful. The world often expects you to do things that are not right that are just a little shade. Your own wicked self oftentimes will prompt you to do something that's a little gray. But may I tell you tonight, Jesus will never command you to do anything that's shady, anything that's gray. And my friend, he's only going to command you to do that which is right. So when the order comes, three things to say are simply this. I ought to I can to, therefore I will to. Notice the solution involves a spoken word. Mary said, whatsoever. He said, just follow what he said. The solution involves a strange word. Whatsoever. I don't know what he's going to ask you to do, but whatsoever he asks you to do, you do it. Then the third thing I want you to know, the solution involves a surrendered will. They had a word from God. They had a work that God wanted them to do. But having the work and having the word also involves the will. God tells us in his word he's not willing that any should perish. That's his spoken word. His work is, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But 
The solution involves our will. Here, they surrendered their will. And I got to think, fancy being told to fill water pots with water when wine was needed. Mary said, whatsoever he says unto you, not do it. And Jesus comes to the service. He says, fellas, you see those water pots over there? I want you to fill them with water. I'd scratch my head saying, what is water going to stop? If he had said fill it with wine, I'd say, where did I get it from? But he said fill it with water. And then he said, I want you to bear it to the governor. Now, wait a minute. You're going to bear it to the governor with water when he's needing wine. I can't do it, Lord. Mary, in one of these servants, I know that what Jesus is going to tell them will most likely not make sense to a natural man. You're not going to be able to logically figure out what pots and water have to do with the supply of wine. There'll be times when God tells you to do something, you'll scratch your head because you don't know what he's doing. But that's all right. Your obedience is not, is not linked to your ability, your ability to understand the plan. Just do it. That's all you got to do. Surrender your will to the spoken word and let God worry about the results. Now, I have my ideas, but I'm not going to deal with it. But while we don't know the exact moment when the water turned to wine, this I do know. It was a result of their obedience to God. The solution to the wine problem was not the servant's reason. Now of being able to understand what God was doing. The solution was the result of the servant's obedience to what God said. Their duty was very simple. And they carried it out faithfully. And as a result, Jesus was able to work with them. That's what he wants to do with us. He wants to work with you and to make you a blessing to the world. But he can only do it if you'll obey him. They had two orders. Very simple. God gave the church an order. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. That's pretty simple. They only had two orders. Both of them are third grader could probably understand. The, and, and the hard part was done by Jesus. What was the two words? First one, fill the water pots with water. Now, I can see them now. This is a definitely strange. Is it not, Brother Ken? Yeah. Is it not, Miss Mary? I mean, these water pots were used for washing the Bible says, purifying of the Jews. You see, at feasts, Jews would frequently wash their hands. And not necessarily that their hands were dirty, but because these washings were part of the rules and the ceremonies of the feast, and you can go back to Mark chapter 7, verse 13, and you'll find where they washed off it. But for this very purpose of washing, there was placed in a room six large stone water pots. The water from which was poured on the guest's hands while he held his hands over a stone basin. And he'd wash his hands. Now, by the way, John wrote his gospel, this gospel. And John wrote his gospel not for Jews, but for Gentiles. That's why he explains many things which a Jew would know all about. The Jews understood it, but the Gentiles did not. There would have been no need to put the explanation of these water pots if he had been writing to Jews. Well, the Lord says, fill the water pots with water. Look at verse 7. They filled it up to the brim. I like that 
because it shows not half-hearted obedience. They went all the way. Some people say, oh, I want to get saved, but all I want to do is get saved from hell. I don't want to serve God. Boy, you're missing out on a lot. They went all the way. And may I tell you, if we're going to obey the Lord, it must be wholehearted. can't be half-hearted. Whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Now, fill the water pots with water. They did. Second command. Bear unto the governor of the feast. Now, I think this one's a little bit hard. The ruler of the feast was not the bridegroom, nor was it the bride's father, but an official whose duty it was to superintend the arrangements and preside over things and see that everybody was comfortable and all went well. We might say a marriage, uh, what do you call it, coordinator. And a matter of fact, he didn't know how near they were to a catastrophe. He didn't even know that. Nobody even told him that the wine is running short. When these water parts of wine are brought to him to taste, he, of course, supposed that it had always been wine. <laughs> when he got a drink of that, he supposed that it had always been wine. The servants knew better. He had the slightest idea that way back there, when they filled those water pots, somewhere behind the scenes, Jesus had been consulted. Jesus had been talked to, and what was in those pots was the result of a miracle. Now, some people say the reason the water turned into wine is because the water blushed when it saw the Son of God. But all he knew was verse number 10. Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And then when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. You kept the good wine until now. All he knew was this good wine was much better than what they had been serving. So in this wonderful way was the happiness of these people unspoiled. But let me tell you this. Such a thing could have never happened if they had not trusted what God said and obeyed what God said. Now I'm going to tell you. I've been in this thing long, long enough to know that sometimes God will tell you to do things, not contrary to the book, but it doesn't make any sense. You can't figure it out. You don't know how you're going to do it. I can remember sitting in this seat one time, and we had a missionary come to church and preach. Now I can tell you right now, at that point in time, I know right now I have a $20 bill in my wallet. But at that time, and normally my wife didn't vouch for it. Do I carry money? I just keep forgetting to deposit the $20 when I go to the bank. But I've been doing online depositing, so I haven't went to the bank yet. And, uh, but this time we had a missionary here, or whatever it was, and I was sitting up here in the front seat, and the small, still boy spoke to me and said, you need to take off an offering, and you need to get you need to sort some money for this individual. And I said, Lord, it's going to be all strange. Because number one, I don't have my wallet. My wallet's in my office. And I'll have to tell them we're going to take up my office, and then I've got to run back to the back and get my wallet. After I said that, I reached back, and I realized I didn't have my wallet like I do tonight. Normally, I, I don't bring it. I, I don't like anything in my pocket. And then when I realized I had it, I said, Lord, but you know I ain't got no money in my wallet. I don't keep money in my wallet. But you want me to do it, so I'm going to look. And I remember taking my wallet and looking in there, and I had money in there that I did not know that I had. Money in there that I forgot that I had. Now, let me tell you something. That seemed like a strange command. And it was strange. But all God wants us to do is obey him when he speaks. He's not going to speak contrary to his word, but if we'll obey God when he speaks, then we leave the results with God. Oswald Chambers said this. 
Our problem today is not a hearing problem. Our problem today is an obedience problem. And I'll tell you what I've seen through this coronavirus. I've seen a lot of rebellion in the hearts of people. Rebellion against the preacher, rebellion against the church, rebellion against the government, but ultimately all rebellion is rebellion against God. You said, what happened? It just took the coronavirus to bring it to the front. You see, we need to learn to obey God, not man. It doesn't make any difference what we think. What does God say? Now, let me tell you what was true for their situation in John chapter 2, a bad situation, a crisis because they have no mind, turns into a celebration because there was a spoken word. He said. There was a strange work. Fill the water punch. Whatsoever. Whatsoever. Strange work. They were surrendered will. Do it. What was true for their situation is equally true for us today. Can I tell you, this Bible has application in the midst of a coronavirus and it's just as applicable today as it was the day it was written. This book is not outdated. You say, preacher, what will consistently turn water into wine? Obedience. Simply put, obey God. Now watch. Fill the water pots with water. They're used for purifying the Jews. We're going to fill it to the brim. And we don't understand it. Don't make sense. And water has nothing to do with wine. Now take that water and take it to the now, here's literally what I believe possible. That the water turned to wine as they were obeying God. As they were obeying God, when they get over there, he gets it, and all of a sudden, it's turned into wine. And I tell you, God can take your panic and bring you from panic to party. From ruin to rejoicing. From ashes to adoration. If you learn, simply obey God. God's still speaking today. God will tell you tonight if you're not saved, you need to be saved. The answer is Jesus Christ. Will you obey him? God will tell you as Christians, obey God. Listen to him. Trust him. May I not submit to you, church? They had to trust what God said to fill the water pots with water. And then to bear out to the governor of the feast. Let me ask you, I got to think about it. These servants probably worked for the governor of the feast. Brother Ken, and if they bring water to him and say, here's some more wine, and he tastes it, and it is water, they're probably going to get fired. But they obeyed God, and God took, the rest, took care of them. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy but to trust and obey. Let's go, Lord, and pray. Father, I pray that some way what I saw in this passage the last couple of days. It's been a blessing to people. Help us, Lord, just to learn to obey you. Just to do what you say. The Bible says, forsake not the gathering of ourselves together. It's a matter of some is. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. We can come up with all kind of reasons, excuses, as to why we can't obey you. I believe we'll be so much, I know we'll be better if we just learn to obey you. Didn't make any sense. Fill water pots with water. Bear to the governor. But 
Mary was right. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Help us, Lord, to be the doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own self. There be somebody out there by means of Facebook It's not saved. Call me. Let me take the Bible and show you. God commands all men today everywhere to repent. Will you trust what he said? You said, I want to go to heaven. The whosoever wills do. Whosoever will not, no. You can trust him today. God's not going to tell you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved if you can't do it. If you'll trust him, he'll save you. If you'd like me to take the Bible and show you, 706-678-1855, church number. 706-318-6614 is my cell number. Reach out to me and let me take the Bible and show you. And I trust you that you'll be in the house of God on Sunday. If at all possible, I understand Lord, those that are 65 and up and have so many conditions that make it impossible. But we need to start making plans to start getting back into the house of God and trusting you, not others. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy but to trust and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.